Christian faith is often viewed as countercultural to the university, specifically running counter to science. But is it counter to science or to a certain philosophy of science? Our culture often underestimates the role of faith and overestimates the role of science. You know, people who lived during the American Civil War seem to have had more in common with Moses and Abraham than with us. And this can largely be attributed to the explosion of information and technology produced through science. To be sure, science is a good tool. Flowing from the university, however, contemporary culture often treats faith in a pejorative terms. The common viewpoint in the university is articulated by Steven Weinberg, a physics Nobel Prize winner who said, the world needs to wake up from the long nightmare of religion. Anything scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion should be done and may in fact be our greatest contribution to civilization. Ironically, Weinberg declined to participate in a debate I moderated, out of which came the book Is Faith in God Reasonable? Debates in Philosophy, Science, and Rhetoric. But another atheist, a philosopher of science, participated. In his book, The Atheist's Guide to Reality, Alex Rosenberg sings a similar note asking, is there a God? No. Uh, what is the nature of reality? Whatever physics says it is. He informs us that the best reason for atheism is science, adopting scientism, the conviction that the methods of science are the only reliable ways to secure knowledge of anything. Certainly the philosopher Jesus disagreed. He viewed the central purpose of human life to consist in the knowledge of God, the creator of physics. He taught us that Christianity is a knowledge tradition. What we have is knowledge. The major concern by philosophers and by theologians in the Middle Ages was largely a project expressed in Latin, fides corens intellectum, means faith-seeking understanding. The great halls of reason today, the modern universities, were for centuries largely established in the context of and motivated by the Christian faith. Most of the founders of the sub-disciplines of science were Christians. Faith informed and inspired their scientific efforts and their reflections. Consider Mendel in genetics, or Pasteur in bacteriology, Kepler in astronomy, Linnaeus in taxonomy, Newton in physics, Boyle in chemistry, and Maxwell in electrodynamics. The list goes on and on of founders of sub-disciplines of science who saw themselves as reading the two books of God, God's world and God's word, as said by the father of modern science, Francis Bacon. Ironically, Weinberg is in the minority. According to the book uh, 100 Years of Nobel Prizes, we learn that from 1901 to 2000, over 60% of Nobel laureates were Christians. Not only is faith shown to be compatible with science, but it is motivated through its emergence and flourishing. The practice of science is done within the context of a worldview. Many assume that when a scientist puts on a white lab coat and pulls measurements, she is merely gathering evidence, faithfully delivering facts, things she's proven to be true. But this is an oversimplification. Science does not prove things true. Science cannot prove things true. Why? Because science relies on inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning in science is commonly works by examining repeated instances of an event and then drawing a conclusion about what must be true for that event to happen again. This is a method of inference. While this form of reasoning is powerful to science, it is a limitation in that we must be content with probabilistic conclusions, not proof or absolute certainty, concepts related more to fields of math and logic. This reveals something very significant. Not only can science never attain certainty, but there are certain things that science can never know. For example, first-person knowledge. No matter how much neurologists can learn about my brain, they can never know, for instance, what it's like to be me, not even in principle. In addition to internal limitations intrinsic to science, science is also limited by several external underlying philosophical assumptions which cannot be settled or justified by science. First, the scientific enterprise assumes that nature exists independent of our minds. While this may seem like common sense, and it's taken for granted. How do you know that you are not, say, being deceived by an evil demon or in a dream state thinking this is reality? Or perhaps your brain is in a vat controlled by a super scientist who is plugging you with electrodes to provide you with virtual images, which is to say not reality. Many do not and have not throughout history believed in the full reality of the external world. This is typical for Eastern thinkers. It cannot simply be assumed, but it makes sense within a Christian worldview. Second, science assumes that nature has an intelligible order that can be known, but appearances and reality are not necessarily the same. Again, this seems just to be common sense, but it too must be embedded in a philosophical framework. The physical structure of the world is describable using the language of mathematics. We learned from Einstein that underlying matter is energy, and underlying energy is what we've since learned is information. This 
points then to a world that is at bottom fundamentally mind and not matter, which is explained best within a Christian worldview. Third, science assumes the existence and applicability of the laws of logic, which are central to rational thought. But note that this is a category of philosophy and not of science. Scientists borrow the philosophy and the laws of logic, such as the law of non-contradiction, the law of excluded middle, the law of identity. They use these in discussing their experimental observations, inferences, and conclusions. Since knowledge of the world is itself questionable, then the status of scientific statements about the world is also questionable. These laws are the preconditions of thought, including scientific thought. They are inescapable truths known with certainty, unlike in matters of science, and are not even known by science, but are instead rationally discerned. But this assumption makes best sense given a certain worldview. Fourth, science typically assumes the reliability of our sense perceptions, including taste, touch, sight, hearing, and smell. They generally assume that our senses accurately deliver for us truth about the world. But how do we know that our faculties provide information about the external world that is accurate? And even if they do, how do we know whether they are truth conducive, which is to say, whether they are designed at giving us true beliefs? This is not unimportant. If scientific naturalism is true, then perhaps they are aimed at survival instead, in which case it is possible that giving false perceptions of the world could provide survival advantage. Having a false sense of perception, depth perception, where you think a predator is much closer than it really is, serves as an example that would send you into flight for survival. This might seem to undermine our confidence in sense perception beliefs being aimed at truth. But it's worse for naturalists who embrace evolution. As atheist philosopher of science Alex Rosenberg says, natural selection sometimes selects for false beliefs and sometimes even selects against the acquisition of true beliefs. One implication of this is that the composed beliefs of naturalism plus evolution or naturalistic evolution seem to carry its own defeater. If both naturalism and evolution are true, we cannot trust that our minds are delivering for us true beliefs about reality, including the beliefs about naturalism and evolution. Unfortunately, our modern notion of science has largely come to mean whatever can be explained in terms of chemistry and physics. But science was not always this way and has taken a decidedly naturalistic philosophical turn. Science comes from its Latin origin scientia, which denotes the fields of all knowledge, not just hard sciences and those who want to be so associated. The Greek equivalent of scientia is episteme, or epistemology, the second major branch of philosophy pertaining to theories of knowledge. The medieval thinkers who founded the modern universities used to say that theology is the queen of the scientia and philosophy is its handmaiden. Imagine the hub of a will representing theology and the spokes uh, representing the diversity of academic disciplines like economics, psychology, language, and mathematics. It's the glue of philosophy that anchors the diversity of disciplines into the unity of knowledge constituting the university. This explains why everyone who possesses a PhD, whether formally trained in philosophy or not, possesses a doctor of philosophy in their respective field. Unity in diversity forms the university, the modern university being largely a product of faith seeking understanding. Some of what counts as science today is not really science, but philosophy hidden in scientific clothing. Our culture has confused science with scientism, the view that the only things that can be known to be true are those which are tested by science. But that statement itself can't be tested by science. It is therefore self-defeating. It is a philosophical statement about science and not a scientific one. No amount of discovery will ever make it true. Considering intrinsic limitations and external presuppositions of science, science requires certain philosophical foundations. These foundations are provided best by the Christian worldview, which is why science itself emerged from within the Christian worldview. We can disabuse ourselves, therefore, of the false philosophy that is scientism and rejoice in the good that is science. The Christian faith is countercultural, not to science, but to scientism. As the former atheist Cambridge thinker C.S. Lewis reminds us, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a legislator. Our culture became scientific because of the knowledge of God.